Last week, we started talking about the five stages of how to find God's will. And uh, before that, we were looking at, you know, the different ideas that people have about it. So this first step was read the Bible. Does this thing match up with the Bible? And we'll look at specific examples and how to find your quote-unquote purpose in life. Um, but for right now, let's just keep on with the five stages. I think we're going to look at stage two and three tonight. Excuse me. This is one that's often neglected. What we want to do is we want to read the Bible and get a quick fix. So maybe we'll read it like one or two days and then we just kind of stop there. And that's a huge mistake. So reading the Bible is the first step and it should be what everything comes down to. But you can't just read the Bible. You have to do something with that knowledge. So it takes us to step two, develop a heart for God. So this takes time and effort. It's not going to be something where you just wake up and you and God are homeboys. It, it's not going to work like that. It requires that you put forth the time in prayer, put forth the time in actually really studying the Bible and applying it to your life. This is not something that's going to be natural. You're going to have in your heart, um, you're going to have things that you want to do. Okay, Like for instance, there was a guy in Bible college um, that he wanted to get with this woman. The problem, she was married. So, of course, he had this special revelation from God that they should get divorced, so he tried to get them to get divorced because it was God's will for him to get with this woman. Do you see what I mean? So if he would have stopped, started with stage one, that God doesn't desire that people get divorced, he would have already had his answer from the Bible. But then if he would have developed a heart for God rather than mystical feelings, this is what Christians think. They think that everything in life comes down to feelings. Like, uh, this is something that uh, Bill Johnson and Bethel Church does, is they make it, oh, well, the Holy Spirit's going to give me special revelation that, that contradicts the Bible. And how will I know that it's true? Well, because I'll feel it. And it's like, well, feelings are not a genuine test of Christianity. Desiring a heart for God, however, sometimes you will, God will impress a certain feeling on you. Take, for instance, two Sunday nights ago, or the three Sunday nights ago, just the severe sense of dread and terror in the building. I mean, it was definitely something that I will always remember. So, I mean, yes, God, does, there, is, there are feelings that go with things and whatnot, and I'm not trying to deny that at all. But when it is completely revolved around your pleasure, your desires, it's a little bit different. So, um, developing a heart for God is not something that will come naturally. The heart wants what it wants. I mean, think of it. Think, I, I've seen so many women get with guys that are not good for them. But then at the end of the day, oh, I just love him. He's so perfect for me. God brought him by. Oh, well, he beats me. But God brought him by. It's like, um, well, you, you know, that's not, see what I mean? The, the heart just kind of wants what it wants. And not only does it want what, it's want what it wants, but it's also very deceptive. Did I write that down anywhere? Yes. And it is very deceiving. Um, it, it's, it's something where your heart will make you think that something's true that's not. And then if you don't have anything to base that off of, it, it'll just destroy you. So uh, does your conscience stop you from what you're about to do? do? And do you feel in your heart like, eh, this might not be a great idea? If you don't have that feeling that comes, this will come as you develop a heart for God, which comes as you read your Bible. It's just, Once again, it's a process. You're not going to read the Bible for two weeks and all of a sudden you know God's heart. It's not like that. It's, it's you know, as you see God and he starts changing you. And then as he changes you, your desires kind of change, and then you have something to go off of. So um, God will kind of impress on you conscience, but let's kind of go to the next thing here. Let God change you and your desires. There's going to be a point where you want what you want, and God wants something else. And you have to reach a point of letting God change you, letting God speak, letting God have the final say. Um, and then your desires will be God's, but there will always be a struggle between what you want and what God wants. It's not always going to be easy and natural. It's, you're, not, you're not ever going to get to a point in life where, oh, I feel like this is the right thing to do, and I just have all knowledge and wisdom. There's a situation right now that us pastors are going through, and we, don't have, we, don't, we have no idea how to deal with it. And I've gone back and forth about 50 different times on what we should do on this. Well, there's three of us, and we're all going back and forth on this. It's not something that's easy. See what I mean? Well, have we, haven't we developed a heart after God? Well, yes, but it's a very complicated matter. <laughs> so anyways... Now, there will always be a struggle between what you want, what God wants. It's really a hard thing. And like I said last last week, yeah, it was last week, you'll never reach a life, – life has um, risks that are involved, just the way that it is. So anyone can mislead themselves. And, and we always say, oh, I would know if somebody was fooling me or, you know, I'll just know. And how? How will you know? If you're not listening to others, like what's the standard of how you will know and how you know you're not being deceived? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Calm down, dude. Um, and anyone can anyone can mislead themselves. Anyone can mislead others. It's just something where your heart cannot be the final say so. If you think that you cannot be misled, there's no other way to say this. You're wrong. Proverbs two one through five uh, says this. It says, "My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God." So he's talking about this process of discovering. God's heart, developing a heart for God. Now, once again, though, this can never be based off of your feelings. It has to be based off of the Bible. So after you've developed this, you can go safely to step number three. Seek wise counsel. See, we get kind of mixed up in things. First off, and I have this on the end of another slide, we kind of get the order and mixed up. And when we mess up the order, we kind of just confuse ourselves. Like, for instance, I'm going to ask somebody who validates me whatever I say. They don't care about what God wants. They just validate me with whatever I say. I'm going to say, hey, should I do this? And they're going to say, yeah, honey, you do that. See what I mean? I, I just looked for somebody to tell me that what I've already decided to do is right. That's not really seeking wise counsel. See what I mean? Um, or we don't develop a heart for God, but then we try to listen to our own emotions and feelings on something. It's like, well, you know, that's not really how it works. Oftentimes the Bible is the last place to go to if we go there at all. And sometimes when Christians go to the Bible, they do it like this. What does the Bible say about? And they're looking for a specific verse that says something like this. Hey, Nicole, for instance, don't get that surgery. Or, uh, hey, Isaiah, listen to this. It's like, it's that's not really how it works. You can't just Google search the Bible. You see what I mean? It's, it, the Bible applies to every single situation you go through, but it oftentimes doesn't say it in the words that you are wanting. And you won't know that if you're not reading it. <laughs> so anyways, um, so seek wise counsel. Now, we will all get to that in just a second. Um, when you're seeking wise counsel, make sure you're asking people who, one, care about you. Sometimes we listen to people who don't care about us. Like maybe somebody comes into the church and they're just saying, you're the worst pastor in the world, you know, uh, you're so corrupt and arrogant. And the people who actually know you, they don't think you think... They don't think you're like that at all. But this person who comes in just says a bunch of mean mean things about you because that's what they perceive, or maybe they're just trying to be mean. See what I mean? That get counsel from people who actually care about you as a person. Now that doesn't mean that they're not going to say things that pisses you off. The wisest of counsel will very often come at you. The, the wisest of counsel will oftentimes come at you in such a way where it, it rubs you the wrong way. That's not what I wanted to hear. You are supposed to tell me that I'm right and everybody else is wrong, and what I've already decided to do is what I should do. See what I mean? And so wise counsel is, is it oftentimes won't won't hit you that way. Also, uh, the people who you ask wise counsel and counsel for, they they should know your mission. Like for instance, the mission of this church is to build bridges in the community. Okay, we're not trying to uh, be the most spiritual. We're not trying to be Beth L. Jr. We're not trying to be you know Bill Johnsons or anything. We're, we're trying to bring people to God, and we're trying to build bridges in the community. That's what we're trying to do here. So when people say, oh, well, we have this really good idea of what you guys could do, it's like, well, does it match our mission? No, then we're not doing it. And the same is true with you as a person. If you have a mission in life, like, for instance, loving God, and somebody comes by and they're trying to give you counsel, but it goes against your mission in life, eh, you really need to be careful about listening to it. And then the third thing is your your purpose, which kind of goes along with mission. I don't really want to explain the difference because it's not really important for today. Anyways, um, don't get people to give you counsel who affirm your sin. You know what I mean? Like you're doing something you don't want to change. Yeah, honey, you should get a divorce. He's so stupid. You're so right. See what I mean? That's not wise counsel. That's your girlfriends that are just... Talking, you know what I mean? That, that's not wise counsel. That's completely different. Um, it's it's best if you find people who can give you counsel who are wiser than you, smarter than you, more experienced Christians. Um, we actually just had a mentor call with with somebody who's been working at, with us for probably about a year and a half now. And when when he got on the call, he said, "Sorry, uh, I almost didn't make this call. I, I just got off with my mentor." See, our mentor was getting mentored. You see how that works? You, you don't get this place of, I know it all, I've got it all covered. You become a learner, and then you help other people, but you're still learning. See how that works? That's, that's a good model. So anyways, um, 
uh, make sure that you are getting counsel from people who are more mature than you. Maybe people who are older because they've kind of walked around the block a couple times. They kind of know a little bit more. Um, not that's not always the case. I have met some really foolish eighty-year-old people. So I mean, you know, you really have to take that with a grain of salt. But um, and this uh, seeking wise counsel really ensures that you are under authority in life. We have this this habit of making sure that we are our own boss. We don't want to listen to other people. We don't. Did he open the door? Oh. We don't want to listen to people. We don't learn, want to learn from people. We want to be right all the time. We want to have all the answers. We don't like being in our places of uncertainty. And uh, when you have to go to others to ask for counsel, it does something in you where you really have to be under authority because then somebody's going to – your your counselor is going to say something like this. You have a really bad attitude, and it's going to hit you hard, and you're not going to have anything to do with it. So either you're going to just say, I don't need your counsel anymore. I'll just go my own way. Or – you're going to realize that you do have a bad attitude. See what I mean? And, and those kinds of wise counselors that are in your life. So wise counsel is good for not just telling you what you should do, but helping you do it the right way and for helping you be in a place of just a, having, a, having a good heart. Um, when God's, th There's a difference between when God sends someone by and somebody being presumptuous. Okay, like Let me explain the difference. Somebody comes up to you and says, I have a word for you, and they give you this quote-unquote prophecy, but it doesn't really apply to anything that you're going through, and you're like, I don't know how, what? Or maybe somebody comes up, and they just don't like you, so they're trying to give you a word, but it's actually then just venting on how you're doing everything wrong. Versus when God sends them somebody by, and they say something that you just like, that is exactly what I'm going through. You know what I mean? I'll give you an example. Um, was it this week? No, last week. There was a situation I was a little bit uh, distracted by it, and somebody came out of nowhere and just texted me and said, "Hey, are you okay?" And then they 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 texted me this thing that was exactly the situation I was going through, and what somebody else, one of my mentors, told me was exactly what they told me, but they didn't know the situation. See how that works? God sending someone by versus someone being presumptuous. See what I mean? Where somebody thinks, oh, I, I have the voice of God. And it's like, okay. And that takes us to the interview we, we watched a couple, probably a couple, like a month or two ago, with John Bevere. Remember that? Now, I'm really, really glad that we watched that. And one of the reasons why is because John tends to be one of those guys that is this this John, John Bevere. Now, I'm not talking about the John in, in our church. <laughs> I, I just realized I shouldn't just say John. Mr. Bevere uh, is one of those uh, people who goes by feelings. He just, you know, what he feels is just right. Well, here's the problem with that. If you remember, he was talking, and he said that he just comes up with these ideas, and that's just the way it was. And his wife just has to get on and get on board with it. So Lynn Lisa was even talking. She said, you know, he comes to me and says, um, you know, we're giving away this many books. And it's like, okay, how do you know that that's God's will? Well, I'm not. You're, you're a doubter. You're bringing down my faith. This is what we're doing. And it's like, your faith in what? How do you even know that that was God's quote-unquote will? See what I mean? It was your idea, and it might have been a good one. It might have been a bad one. I'm not the one to judge that. But how does he know that it's God's will if he's going off of his own feelings and his wife, his number one counselor, he completely forgo her advice and didn't ask anybody else more mature than him for advice? And then he did this, and it's the same thing Bill Johnson does too. I decide, and then I look for people who agree with me. And if anybody agrees with me, it's just their lack of faith. They're the doubters, and I shut them out. I don't listen to them. And it's like, what? <laughs> now, now there has to be there has to be like a uh, a contrast to this too. Don't just listen to everybody. Not everybody's going to be in it for your sake, and not everybody's going to be smart. You have to. You have what we what I do as a pastor, and Chuck does this, and I'm pretty sure, and yeah, dad, my dad does this too. We have a circle, an inner circle. Those people know us intimately, very, very intimately. And when we have a problem, we go to that circle and we say, look, this person accused me of this. Do I have that trait? And those people will be absolutely 100% real and honest with us. Yes, you are definitely doing that. Or no, you are not doing that. See what I mean? We don't surround ourselves with, with a whole bunch of people who don't really know us and then say, hey, uh, are we doing this right? Well, how would they know? <laughs> well, you look a good part when you're on the stage. So what does that prove? Anybody can look good on stage. So he just came up with something, and that's just the way it was. And he assumed that what he felt must have been God. Oh, this is God's revealed will. But here's the thing. He made his voice equal with God's. So he's not listening to the wisdom of the Bible where it says, you know, talking about 
finances and how to do finances properly. It's not hey, he didn't listen to you know any of those things. Um, he's you know d the developing a heart for God. That's kind of iffy on that one. But then he didn't have any wise counselors in his life. So on the first three stages, you got you got murky ground, just muddy ground. See what I mean? And did the things that he do were they were they good? Yes, I believe that they did benefit people. However, were they wise? See what I mean? And oftentimes we look for wisdom without, without, or we look for God's will without really being wise about things. Now, with that being said, though, it should be said that oftentimes our, our logic will lead us astray. My point being, if I was him, I would have gone through other processes than that. If I had this idea, I would have taken it to prayer. If I really felt strong about it, I would have talked to Gracie about it. See what I mean? Is what it, what was her thoughts on it? So I mean, if your wife is not on or spouse is not on board with the direction that God is quote unquote leading you, then it's probably not God because God will do something in your spouse's heart too. You don't know how many missionaries that I've talked to where, where their spouse at, at the same time God was speaking to them too, and they said, "Hey, I think this is crazy, but I think we might we, we should do this." And the spouse is like, "That's exactly what I was thinking. Let's pray about it." But instead, there's none of that with John Revere. It was just, you know, releasing your dream and all this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, it's it's more it's more than that. And that's what people want is they want that quick release of your potential. But they don't want to develop their heart for God. They want it all about them, my potential. So um, it's really only a matter of time when you get in that kind of a situation where you mess up. I mean, take, for instance, Ravi Zacharias, who had great things to say. But he didn't have the proper um, checks in place. He didn't have people who, you know, authority figures in his life that were, you know, keeping things in watch. He didn't have stuff on his phone and stuff like that for, you know, anti. Well, you get what I'm saying. He he could have gone. He could have taken steps to make sure that he didn't do things. And then when he did do something, he could have taken a step back and said, "I am living in sin. I need to step back from this ministry." But he didn't do any of that. Instead, he just. Kept plowing ahead, <laughs> and uh, you know it's only a matter of time when you get in that kind of a position because you get you get you get a lot of publicity, and then you start thinking that your voice is equal with God's voice, and then you start surrounding yourself with people like Bill Johnson and Bethel Church, and that's exactly what they teach, and that's just a sinking ship. So, anyways, um, so he wouldn't listen to his wife's advice, and oh, you're just acting out of a lack of faith. Well, that's just a foolish way to to that's just a foolish way to. To, to do that. And that's also not being made one with your spouse. It's more time consuming when you're married, but it's also more beneficial in a lot of ways because your spouse kind of gets to rule you and give you perspective that you didn't think of. Um, so Bill, I had already mentioned this, Bill Johnson with this whole deny the doubters thing. Um, but here's the thing. Oftentimes obstacles will tell where your heart is. Okay. Like let's say for instance, you're doing something too quickly. You're, you you got gung ho. You just da, 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 da. and so then the smallest thing upsets your plans, and you get way overblown mad about it. It revealed your motivation. See what I mean? You your heart wasn't right. Maybe the thing that you were doing was good, but you weren't, weren't really you didn't really have the right heart going into it. Um. Yeah. And I already mentioned that. So there's a few things about wise counsel. Number one, does the person know you well? Do they know you well? Do they know all your flaws? Do they know your bullcrap stories? You can fool a lot of people. You can fool a lot, a lot of people. But you need somebody who can give you counsel who who sees past the bullcrap. You know what I mean? They know the real you. You can't fool them. Um, the second question: Have they earned your trust? People, you can't just give people trust. They have to earn it. What have the people that you are trusting? What have they done to earn that trust? Are they people who have given wise counsel? Are they? Do they give counsel that lines up with the Bible? Or do they give counsel that doesn't? Have they been responsible for a lot of bad mistakes or responsible? And then, then look at their life. Do they make good decisions in their own life? Now, there's a lot of different things you can look at with that. The third thing, do they have a good track record? Oh, well, this person, they went to this church and there was a problem there. So they went to the next person, next church and they caused a problem there. And then they always said it was somebody else's fault, but somehow they were always in the middle of the conflict. That's probably not a person you need to be having having give you counsel. Um, and then the last thing, um, I have noticed though all of these things being said that sometimes God will intervene in a situation 
where, where somebody maybe asks the wrong way or something like that. Like, here's a good example. Balaam in the book of Numbers. It says that he was finding out what God wanted to say by divination, which God had clearly forbidden. And yet God was still telling him, you know, giving him prophecies. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know how, but there's the standard, the rule, and then sometimes God sidesteps his rule. I don't exactly how I understand how this rules, how this works. So I'm not trying to teach anything that's weird, but uh, hold on. And then he, but when somebody is humble. Now I've used a bad example. Balaam wasn't humble. Um, another example that I could bring of somebody who wasn't humble was the situation in Samuel where uh, Saul goes to the seer to get to you know to have a seance and raise up Samuel. Another time when God overlooked the wrong of the situation to speak. But what I'm talking about here is when somebody's humble. I've seen somebody who just doesn't have great theology, but they trusted God with their whole heart. And they really, really, really prayed a heartfelt prayer. And for some weird wackadoo thing, God actually answered them. I can't explain how it works, but I know that sometimes God has grace on the humble. Now, I will say this, though. I am not saying that you need to go ahead and be an idiot on what you believe, just in hopes that God might intervene. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that just because God has intervened in us, maybe, for instance, some people say this. Well, my friend, they didn't go to church. They didn't believe this. They don't read the Bible. And God still, okay, I'm not denying that. Maybe God did overlook because they just came humble. God does do that. But that's not the standard of what should be just because God had mercy on someone approaching the wrong way. Does that make sense? I hope it kind of makes sense because I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> There's two big reasons that people too often go for counsel, and both of these reasons are totally wrong. Number one, to be affirmed by people. I've made up what I want to believe, and now I'm going to you for you to validate what I've already decided to do. Well, there's a big problem with that. Do you know it's wrong? If you do know that it's wrong, don't go to other people to, to talk you into doing something bad. And then if you don't know whether or not it's wrong, why don't you? Why haven't you de been developing a heart for God? See what I mean? There's a lot of times we go, excuse me, and we don't understand how, what to do in, the, in a given situation because we're not praying, we're not seeking after God, so we want somebody else to kind of just fill that gap. And that takes us to the, to the second one, to shortcut not being in communion with God. I don't want to develop a heart for God. I want you to give me a quick answer. There was one person who God actually had me go give him a word, and then he decided not to listen to it, and then he came and asked me again, you know, what does God say about this? And I was like, that's kind of weird. It's like I'm, I'm his personal prophet or some nonsense. And I, you know, this is where it really gets weird. God specifically told me, go tell him, go ask for yourself. And I thought, okay, that's cool with me. And it kind of releases me from that problem. <laughs> right. So I went to them and I said, you need to start seeking God for yourself. I mean, he gave you a word before and you didn't even listen to it. Now you want to know what... Why don't you start praying and reading your Bible? And then, then you know, you and God, you know, do you guys. You guys, you pray and he'll answer and then just leave me out of this. Like, <laughs> Anyways, um, as you grow, you will gain a conscience and, draw a, and, and, and you will get a different draw from the draw to sin. Like you always have that draw to sin and you will always mess up in sin. But there will be like um, like this draw to do a certain thing. You know what I mean? Like a good example of this would be um, when God calls someone to be a pastor, where it's oftentimes not exactly what they want, and God, you know what I mean, and God will call, there, there's that draw, you know what I mean, but it's different than the draw to sin. Does that kind of make sense? Say it again. Yeah. I missed what you said. As you grow in relationship with God, first off, you'll grow in, you'll grow in a conscience. Mm -hmm. So where, to where like things will, 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 like let's say for instance, here's a good example. There was a guy that I was talking to. Uh, he he was he slept around all the time. He didn't have any problem with it. He slept with married people. He slept with single people. He slept with underage people. He didn't care. He just slept with everybody. I mean, if it had legs, well, he would find a way to have sex with it. And uh, well, then he got saved. Well, that changed things. And he started seeking after God, and and he changed. Like he felt wrong. He felt very convicted about it. He was living with his girlfriend when he got saved, and he said, "This this is over. You got to move out." You see what I mean? Like God gave him a conscience. And as we see God, God will you know, give us consciences about something. Like here's a good example. People who, it, it's not uncommon to co-sign on a loan. But when you see God and, and he's growing you and he's helping you learn in finances, 
you read Proverbs and it says don't sign, co-sign on a loan, and then you kind of your heart starts to change and you start so you start you know what I mean, and then a situation will come by where you can co-sign on a loan, and then you'll just be like, I don't feel good about this. This isn't like how God wants me to spend my finances. You see what I mean? And then second to that, you'll get a different draw, like a draw to do the right thing. Like so, they'll, they'll, there's the draw to sin. You know what I mean? Where like uh, I want to look at porn, I want to go get tr drunk or high, I want to, you know, all these things, okay? But it'll be different from that. It'll be like a different draw, like a draw to do something that God wants, you know what I mean? Um, like I want to read the Bible instead of just reading it out of duty. You know I, I, mean? I, I want to pray. I want right, to pray. right. Like a different draw, right. a different call, a different draw. I don't know how else to say it. Um, God's call is, is given by the Holy Spirit and confirmed by the church. That is absolutely a, a, that's absolutely true. We see that happen in the Bible. We see that happen in real life. If you think you, like here's a good example, people think this. You, you get this young guy who thinks that he knows everything. I feel like God's calling me to be a pastor. He has no people skills. He has no experience in life. He has no experience pastoring. He has no idea what it's required to be a pastor. And you know. He went from high school to pastoring. That's the dumbest mistake you can make. Go get a job somewhere and on a low tier. Be, get, be a peon for a while. And then get hired as an associate pastor or as a youth pastor. And not the senior. Anything but the senior pastor. And then do that for a couple years. But no matter what you do, when you become a senior pastor, it's totally different than anything you ever imagined. It's worse. <laughs> uh, so God's call is given by the Holy Spirit, but then it's confirmed by the church. Don't go to people to validate you, but God has a way of validating calls. Like, for instance, um, I really feel called to be a worship leader. So then you talk to the pastor or something like that, right? And then he says, um, well, you're tone deaf. You can't play any instruments. Uh, maybe you just like music. See what I mean? Or... You go and you say, you know, I really feel like um, God wants me to do this. And they say, that's, you have just the right per talents for that. That's perfect for you. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so what the Bible says, what God impresses on me, what others say. The danger, and I have it here on the last thing, is the misplaced order. I'm going to go to people to validate me. And then I'm going to say that my feelings are God's impressions. And then I'm not going to go to the Bible at all. See what I mean? The wrong order. So, um, uh, there's a few signs of not being under authority, and we'll close with this. Number one, you see truth is relative to self. It's fine for you, but for me, I don't feel like that's, I don't feel like, you see what I mean? You, you have a different standard for you, and if the pastor tries to, like, teach you anything, no, I'm not going to listen to that. That's fine for you. It's, just, you know, it's not for me. See what I mean? That holding back, like, no, I'm not going to submit to your authority. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, number two, talking bad or complaining or gossiping specifically about authority figures. I mean, obviously doing that at all is bad. But people who are not under authority, they just have this this, this problem with authority figures. And so they'll go, actually go out of their way to do things against uh, specifically against an authority figure. Um, th you know, they'll look for opportunities to talk bad about them. And number three, uh, an inability to not be in control. The, these people are oftentimes uh, control freaks. They oftentimes have a hard time in prayer because they don't know how to just hand it over to God. Um, they try and tell everybody else how to do their job. Uh, they it, just generally speaking, they have an inability to not be in control. And number four, uh, open or sly, either or, com uh, opposition to authority's direction. So, for instance, an open opposition would be like um, they're very outspoken, and they specifically go out and say. Um, you're wrong on that. You know what I mean? Just somebody who's calling, causing a lot of conflict in a church, which we know it's not God's will to cause conflict in a church. Um, and then, and then, uh, sly opposition would be where they're going and saying stuff behind people's backs, trying to, like, you know what I mean, instigate the attitude a little better. You know what I mean? Like, oh, so maybe maybe Chuck did something that pissed uh, you off, Isaiah, right? And so you're all telling me you're like, yeah. And then I say something like this. Yeah, it really sounds like Chuck's just not a very good pastor. See what I mean? Little snide cutting remarks to get somebody to oppose. See what I mean? Do things undercover to try and instigate somebody else to rise up against authority. So then they can say, I, I, what? I didn't do anything. This actually happens more than, more than you'd think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that, that would be an example of sly opposition to, to authority's direction, doing stuff behind closed doors. Uh, 
Um, number five, uh, an inability to listen. Uh, they think that they're always right. They think that they're more spiritual than everybody else. An inability to learn. They, they only read books that validate the views that they already have. They're unable to go to a view that's different from them and actually sit and think about it. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about reading a book by an atheist if you're a Christian. I'm talking about this. Reading Bill Johnson books and not being willing to, to listen to somebody else who disagrees with Bill Johnson. That's what I'm talking about. Um, and an, an inability to admit failures. I have done nothing wrong. It's like in Proverbs it talks about this. The adulterer, right? Who she goes and you know commits adultery and then she wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. You know, and there's the same kind of people out there who cause problems in a church, and they do the exact same thing. Oh, I've done nothing wrong. It was the pastor. You know, he was just an arrogant person. Oh, well, this church is, just isn't a real church. You know what I mean? It's always somebody else's fault. Um, number six, uh, bad luck that always seems to follow the person. Oh, well, they're just unlucky. Or, like the Bible says, sometimes God does actually place curses on people where it's like everything that they touch goes to poopy. <laughs> So, uh, and then the seventh, and, and these, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, listening and associating with unsubmissive people. You can tell um, when people have a problem by who they're ministering to. Like, for instance, uh, there's this person who just was always causing problems. And then all of a sudden, they've got all these other people, oh, the pastor didn't listen to you. And all these people who are causing problems are now giving ear to this person, and they're lending an ear so that they can pray for them. Okay. So all these people who have a problem with the authority structure of the church are flocking around you, who also has a problem, authority problem, and that doesn't seem weird. And, and we we, we kind of cloak it and like, well, it's different because I, you know, uh, well, I'm just so spiritual that I can't possibly get caught up in any sin. It's just the pastor's fault, you know, and stuff like that. The pastor wasn't sensitive enough, sensitive enough, or something like that. So uh, look at who somebody is associating with their close friends. Um, look at who you're associating with. When you have somebody in your life that is um, at this level, you'll never be over that level if you surround yourself with people at this level. This is actually a financial principle. If you want to be rich, you don't hang around with people who are at your financial level. You hang with people who are above your financial level. It's the same thing with, 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 with friendship. If you, want to be, if you want to be more spiritual and mature, you don't hang out with people who are unmature or immature. And sometimes what we do is, well, I want to be a light to atheists or something like that. So then all we do is we have a bunch of atheist friends, but then we're, we don't have any Christian friends. See what I mean? And so it gets imbalanced. And then we have a lot of problems. So anyways. Because the more, the more you hang around certain people, the more you become like them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, I'm not talking about the law of attraction. I'm not talking about that. It's just so that we're all clear. I'm not talking about that. But it's just um, more of um, the law of attraction. Well, I don't really want to get into that, but. I feel like Chuck already talked about it a couple months ago, so I feel like if you have any questions about that, just go watch his series before this one. I think it was that one. So anyways, um, any questions on any of that? We've got the first three stages. Read the Bible, develop a heart for God, and then seek wise counsel. A good pattern here. Um, we'll continue with the last two stages next week. Right, any questions? Good? Yep. Okay, so the first game that we are going to play